please welcome to the stage Atul Butte. Thanks for having me this morning, this afternoon. How many of you have this book at home? Raise your hands. It's about half the audience. This is the famous book on cooking, The Joy of Cooking, or Marambar, 75 years of publication. This is the masterpiece of cooking. It's actually a great example for wishful thinking, actually. We all buy this book to kind of improve our recipes. I don't know how much it actually really does. I'm here to talk about your DNA, your genome. And your genome is essentially a cookbook just like this. But the recipes are for proteins. Proteins do all sorts of useful things in your body. They serve as messages between different parts of your body. They optimize chemical reactions that would otherwise take months. They only take microseconds. They enable motion. All of those are the recipes that come out of your own cookbook, your DNA. But your DNA is a lot bigger than the joy of cooking. In fact, if you add it up at six billion base pairs, three billion, three billion came from your mom, three billion came from your dad, if you do the math, that's about 4,000 copies of The Joy of Cooking. This is only about 100 here. If actually, if you stack them up, uh, it adds up to two and a half Statues of Liberty. Imagine all of those cookbooks crammed into the middle of every single one of your cells. That's what's operating today in each and every one of you. Now, we all have these cookbooks. And to write down this cookbook is the ultimate science project, right? That is what the Human Genome Project was for 13 years, $3 billion to get that, those cookbooks written down. And of course, you've heard the price is plummeting. This graphic, I'm sure you haven't seen this slide already today. On this graphic, it's a famous graphic from the NIH that indicates that if we were following Moore's law, it would cost $5 million to get your own cookbook written down. In fact, it costs us only a couple thousand dollars today. And we can do it in about a day or two instead of 13 years. In fact, the price keeps plummeting. Cliff Reed, who's the CEO of a company called Complete Genomics down in Mountain View, says we shouldn't be surprised by the end of this decade if it ends up costing $33 for our genome. I think some of you are probably going to end up paying more than that for parking today here. <laughs> and when the Genome Project was underway 10, 15 years ago, it was done in centers like this. This is an example of the inside of the Whitehead Institute in Cambridge, Massachusetts. And you can see some robots working in the middle moving slabs of gels from place to place, cutting them, feeding them into sequencers, staff of about eight running this center. And now we're talking about getting our genome sequences on devices like this. This is a sequencer that plugs in to the USB port of your laptop, a product that's going to be coming out from Oxford Nanopore and others. The technology keeps dropping. The price keeps dropping. The technology is smaller. It's a no-brainer this is going to have an impact in medicine. So scientists have been looking at the different spots in our genome for the past five or 10 years, identifying patients with disease, without disease, and trying to find those spelling differences. What spelling differences go along with all these different spots in our genome? But what are we going to do with all of these cookbooks? Well, let's go back to our analogy here for a second. I'm showing you here a bunch of restaurants in downtown Palo Alto, kind of close to Stanford, and the display is from Yelp. And you can see here that uh, some of the restaurants are doing well. They're close to five stars. And some are doing not so well. They're down to three or two stars here. There are a lot of reasons why a restaurant does well or poorly. Sometimes it's the wrong environment. Sometimes they're not using great ingredients. Sometimes there are parasites in those restaurants. And of course, sometimes there's something wrong with their cookbooks. And maybe they're spelling differences, something subtle. Maybe they're missing entire chapters. Maybe the chapters are all mixed up, but some part of why restaurants fail has to do with the cookbooks. And of course, the analogy is the same for humans and disease. There are many reasons why we all in this audience are going to end up with disease. Right? A lot of it has to do with our behaviors and our habits and our environment. Some part of it has to do with the parasites that affect us. And of course, some part has to do with the cookbooks. So scientists have been studying these cookbooks looking for the spelling differences again and again, disease after disease. Instead of showing it with stars like this, they show it in a display like this. It's called a Manhattan plot. And across the bottom, you see all the different spots in the genome. And the taller the peak, the more likely it is that spelling difference has something to do with the disease. Here, this is a disease called diabetes, type 2 diabetes, adult onset diabetes. And they're saying in this graphic that the spelling difference in this particular recipe, TCF7L2, uh, has something to do with getting diabetes someday. 
TCF7L2 kind of sounds like a, I don't know, Icelandic recipe to me, who knows. So we're collecting these one by one. Scientists have been running these studies again and again and again, disease after disease after disease, until one day at Stanford, we had a patient show up with his genome. And now this is an unusual patient. His name is Steve Quake. He's actually a bioengineering faculty member. He started companies in this space. And he presents to his doctor. So I'm a doctor. Let's, present, let's pretend this is a medical grand rounds for a moment here. Right? I'm presenting to you a 40-year-old white male who's presenting to his doctor in good health. He exercises regularly. He takes no medications. Why is he coming to the doctor today? It has to do with that family tree on the right there. Steve Quake is the red circle. And his nephew in the blue circle died of sudden death. 19 years old, one morning, he didn't wake up. So Steve Quake goes to his cardiologist, Ewan Ashley, and says, Doc, am I going to die from sudden death? Here's my genome. Patient has a heart rate, blood pressure, blah, blah, blah. Patient presents with 2.3 million differences in his genome compared to the reference, whatever reference means. And by the way, doctor, your next patient's already here in the waiting room. No one's ever going to give us more than 15 minutes to deal with this. So this became an exercise of what we could do with a patient and a doctor, let's say, in a future 15-minute encounter. So of course, we've got to look at the recipes for the heart. And we start to look one by one. Over the past 20 years, a lot of scientists have found a lot of different spelling differences that are associated with heart disease and sudden death. And thankfully, Steve Quake doesn't have any of those. But another way to have sudden death is actually to have a heart attack. It doesn't kill you that young. And there are a lot of recipes for that. And it turns out Steve Quake does have a particular spelling difference in a particular recipe that sets him up to have a heart attack. In fact, it runs in his family. So if we put in his age and lipid levels, nobody would start him on any medications. But given that spelling difference, we recommended to Steve Quake, you should start on statins to hopefully prevent that first heart attack. It's been written up in many newspapers. Steve Quake has decided not to start on the statins that we re recommended for him. We have yet to find the gene in the genome for compliance with medical care. <laughs> I kind of think Steve Quake doesn't have that gene there. Now, of course, another part of medicine is to talk about the drugs. And to make a long story short, given the work of Russ Altman and his team, we can say something about 150 drugs today. If he decides to start on statins someday, he's probably not going to get that really rare side effect. If you start some blood thinners, we can figure out the dose there. The idea is, for 150 drugs now, we can figure out whether the drug might work, what the dose might be, and importantly, whether someone might end up with the adverse events for that drug. And my team was actually stuck with all the rest of medicine. And we had to start reading and reading every single paper, all those Manhattan plots, one by one, to make a catalog of just every spot in the genome associated with the different disease. You know, here's one paper. Here's six papers. Here's 100 papers. Here's 1,000 papers. We've actually read more than 12,000 papers now, writing down every single one of their findings. You know, reading papers kind of sounds boring, so I'm just going to call this retroactive crowdsourcing. <laughs> the crowd doesn't even know they're helping me here. I'm going to take their scientific findings, and we're going to apply it to that patient that walks in, like Steve Quake. We come up with ways to visualize that like this. This is Steve Quake and Alzheimer's disease. And the way to read this is top to bottom. Steve Quake starts with a 9% chance of having Alzheimer's disease. Even if you don't know his genome, right? Nobody starts at zero. We all have some chance of getting every disease. And the spots in the genome, the spelling differences at the top, are the more believable ones. Published in six papers, five papers, four papers. The one at the bottom is the least believable. It's only been shown in one paper by studying only 170 patients. The idea here is if you're a conservative doctor or a conservative patient, maybe you can draw the line in the middle. But regardless here, Steve Quake is likely, less likely to end up with Alzheimer's disease than everyone else. By the way, those of you who are new fans of Nate Silver and his success in uh, predicting the election this week will quickly recognize this is a Bayesian approach, the only right way to do this. Well, if we could do this for one disease, we can do it for all of them. And we call this colloquial a risk, riscogram. And not to be morbid here, but we're all going to die someday, even in this audience. And Steve Quake, we would predict, is going to have a problem with obesity, coronary artery disease, and type 2 diabetes. The black triangles indicate what we thought the risk was, not knowing the genome. The lines now indicate what the new risk would be calculated at, given the genome. Now, this 15-minute encounter is going to be kind of depressing if all we're going to do is talk about how you're going to die. 
I don't think, think that's the way we're going to go. But I think we do have a way to take care of these problems. And that's really the behavior and the environment. I think the future role of the physician is to really help patients understand what can they do to compensate for that genome. Not to be depressed about it, but what do we do about it? And so we came up with the InfoWiz way to show that here. Here I'm just showing you the same diseases, now based on font size. And you see arrows because some diseases cause other diseases. And all along the edge are known environmental and behavioral factors that have been published to influence the risk of getting these diseases. Bigger font size, again, means more important here. So, Steve Quake, based on your genome, we recommend you don't smoke, you should exercise, you should watch your diet, and you should watch your alcohol. Probably didn't need a genome for those four. <laughs> but in tiny font at the top here, Steve Quake, I don't know if you love to garden, but stay away from the pesticides. The pesticides, because your genome says you're at slightly higher risk to get Parkinson's disease, and 10 papers have been published showing that risk of Parkinson's has something to do with getting exposed to pesticides. This is crude first pass, but this is maybe a way that doctors and patients can talk about their genomes. So to close out this thinking here, how on earth are we going to expect a physician to actually review six billion base pairs, six billion letters in a 15-minute encounter? Actually, we do already expect certain kinds of doctors to review one gigabyte of data in 15 minutes. They're called radiologists. And a spiral CT or an MRI or whole body PET scan, they're routinely looking at a gigabyte of data, but they're not looking at it with the ones and zeros. They have computational tools here, visualization, to help them make it through that particular figure and render a diagnosis in 15 minutes. I'm excited because I think this audience is going to be the next generation of tool makers here for the physicians to help them get through the genome and the enviroam and the proteome in the same kind of way. We just need the tools and we need the training. Maybe we should start training every medical student in medical school about the DNA. Maybe we should just start in elementary school, right? Don't be afraid of your genome. These are your recipes. Learn about them. So in closing, I'd like to just think that you shouldn't be afraid of your genome. The doctors can do it. Patients are going to be there. When I think of what the future physician is going to be about, I'm imagining someone like a master chef. Think about, uh, think about Gordon Ramsay. Gordon Ramsay can walk into a restaurant in 15 minutes and diagnose that restaurant. He looks at the environment. He looks at the ingredients. And he looks at the cookbooks. I can't wait for myself. I want to go to my doctor someday who's going to diagnose, who's going to look at my ingredients and my cookbooks, and isn't afraid to teach me what I can do to improve my own health. Thank you very much.